So welcome to the second lesson of the automating GIS processes course. Um, and I'll actually start it from lesson one motivation for the course. So today we will learn to use GeoPandas, which is one of the many uh, useful spatial libraries that you can use uh, in Python for handling spatial data. Oops, is here. So in this uh, course motivation site, there's a long list of packages you might want to check out. And naturally, we are building upon this basic data analysis libraries, pandas, numpy, uh, matplotlib for plotting. Last week, we learned shapelink for um, handling geometries. And today, we will then uh, see how geopandas can be used to read and write spatial data and to manip manipulate the geometries and then do everything you can do in pandas regarding data analysis. And geopandas then relies on multiple other packages. Good to know the names of, for example, Fiona, PyProy, um, GDAL, and others. But Fiona and PyProy, I would say, and Shapely, of course, are the most relevant because then sometimes you need to go to read the documentation of these other uh, other uh, packages when, for example, reading reading data or writing data, you might need to check Fiona uh, documentation for further details. All right, uh, so lesson two is basically, there's two main parts. Um, so we'll first get to know GeoPandas. Uh, and then in the after the break, we will uh, learn how to manage uh, coordinate reference systems. Uh, using GeoPandas and PyProy. So this is kind of, we will cover things that are very central to handling spatial data in Python during this lesson. And learning goals cover basic stuff. So you will learn how to read and write spatial data from different file formats. So we already know how to read text files or tabular data from CSV files. Um, but now you will learn um, how to read, for example, geo packages or shape files. Then we will see how we can interact with the data using GeoPandas. Uh, and we will automate a little kind of data processing workflow. And then indeed, still we'll learn how to manage coordinate reference systems uh, in Python. OK. Uh, I know that there are some, some students who haven't taken like tens of credits of GIS, that's fine. But if there are some concepts or file formats or words that you don't understand, uh, feel free to ask in the chat. Uh, and then of course, maybe you can even make a little word list for yourself for things to check uh, concepts to uh, define later. And feel free to also ask me so we can then add them to the glossary of the of the web pages. Uh, this page contains a list of well concepts or uh, terms or even file formats that you should be or I'm I'm assuming that you are familiar with. Uh, some of you might not be, uh, but that's that should be fine. Just a quick overview. So. Shapefile is this kind of grand old lady of uh, spatial data formats. Those who have used ArcMap must be familiar with shapefiles. So if you are not yet familiar with those, you, you will be after this lesson. Then GeoPackage is this kind of newer, uh, maybe more efficient uh, way of storing spatial data in files. And I think you can also put raster data in there. Uh, then CRS stands for coordinate reference system, which then relates to map projections. So, so far we have been working with um, abstract coordinates in Shapely, but now we will actually put those, link those coordinates to actual locations on the earth. And then datum, datum is, for example, then uh, concepts related to coordinate reference systems. Uh, and in practice, we will refer to these different different coordinate reference systems using the EPSG codes. So 
when you when you actively work with spatial data, you start to learn some of those by heart, but there is a good documentation of the various EPSG codes online. And you can read um, my version of how to define these concepts in, in here. So for example, if we have this latitude longitude data, uh, so that's often VGS84 uh, and the EPH EPSG code is 4326. So I would say that's the most common format in which you might get data. But then, for example, when working in Finland, we have these uh, local localized uh, projections uh, with their own codes. Mm, yes, but we'll return to this kind of coordinate reference system stuff after the break, I believe. Um, all right. So then uh, let's start working hands-on introduction to GeoPandas uh, lesson starts from here. Sorry, actually, yes, I'm okay. I'm missing one, one page in this um, table of contents, but that's fine because we'll start now working in the instance. So if you haven't yet done so, please go and launch your um, CSC notebooks and you can find the lesson materials under um, or the GIS notebooks lesson two. Check marks. Okay, so let's start uh, the lesson from this data in and out data IO uh, notebook, uh, which is a Kind of a, just a quick tutorial and introduction on uh, the various uh, for, forms of data that you can actually read in to Python using GeoPandas and Fiona. Mm, so in the lesson and in this week's exercise and in the course we won't be needing all of these but just to kind of start with the full kind of full platter of what all we could do. Um, so in case in your own project, you then get data, you have data in a map info tab format or in a post GIS database. So this page contains the basic syntax for reading in data from, from different types of sources. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, GeoPandas uses um, Fiona in the background for reading in files. So if we first import GeoPandas as GPD, uh, we can check the available uh, drivers. So drivers are then related to these different file formats that can be written and read from the disk. Uh, so just by running this first um, code cell, you can press play there or then control enter, we can get a Python dictionary that uh, tells us which uh, data formats are by default uh, available uh, to be read using GeoPandas and Fiona. Uh, and just as a side note, so in this notebook I have now everything is readily written in, so we won't be yet coding. We will start, start coding then in the next notebook. Uh, so indeed, this is a Python dictionary. Uh, there are these little, there's always the kind of file format or the driver and then this mode. So R stands for read, W stands for write, and then read and write, you can, you can do both. Uh, so there might be some familiar ones. S shapefile is the driver for shapefiles. Then GeoJSON is a common file format that's listed in there. Uh, we have map info file, uh, and others. So you can enable even more drivers uh, in, in Fiona if needed, but this list is uh, more than enough for this lesson at least. Okay. Uh, so then the first code cell uh, is the syntax for reading shapefiles. So GeoPandas has this read file uh, function where we pass the file path 
uh, with the extension by default, uh, GeoPandas reads shape file, so we only need to specify the file path. And then uh, the syntax for writing to file is to file and then file path. And by default, uh, the file file format will be shape file. I think it doesn't work if you don't have the extension in there. You might try. So if you want, you can run this code cell. We have some sample data readily in this instance under the folder data. Uh, and here, uh, maybe we'll discuss the structure of shape files again a bit later, but just as a refresher that shape file is not only this uh, SHP file, there's at least is it three or four different files related, related to the shape file. And then, for example, the projection information is uh, stored in this PRJ file. So sometimes it might happen that you somebody sends you a shape file as an email attachment, and they only have this SHP file. So then you need to ask for them to actually share share all these kind of sidecar files. I think I had listed them in here. I'll just quickly quickly show. Um, quickly show those. Yes, so you need to have the SHB, SHX, and DBF. So this one contains the shapes, and the DBF contains the attribute table. And then in addition, uh, you can have the projection file, and then other files such as index indices and others. So you can read more about the shape file data for format in here. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, I'll maybe run this first cell to demonstrate. So with this syntax now, uh, there should be this temp folder, just an empty folder for demonstration. So now uh, we read the file in and then wrote a copy to another location uh, using, using pandas. So this file happened to have the projection file with it. Uh, so that's, that's in there. So then there are similar examples for GeoJSON. I might not now run all of these. Uh, KML, we will have a KML input file, I think next week or the following week. Then this geo package. So I would suggest geo package as the kind of, if you share data, put it into a geo package. Mm, but in this lesson today, we will actually work with shape files because that's still, it is a common data format out there and it's good to know good to know how to uh, organize your shape files even though it's maybe well i don't know there's different opinions but maybe not the most efficient um, way of storing data nowadays anymore uh, here is syntax for a, a kind of file geodatabase so the uh, database file format in arcmap uh, this should be the syntax for writing to file, but I think you need to install some additional packages for this to work. But if, if you get data from geo package, you can then uh, read it using uh, Python and store it in some other format. That's what I would do here. The speciality is that you have the geo database and then you always have layers inside. Uh, so that's good to note. The same thing actually with um, geo packages you could then have add the layer name in there or your geo package might have multiple layers. Map info tab. Mm, so this page should give you the correct syntax to get started with uh, the most common GIS file formats. But as said, in this course, we'll focus on shape files. We have some GeoJSON, maybe KML geo package. I think that's it. Um, okay. Then this is a bit of extra, but of course, it's if you have big data sets or uh, data sets that are shared within your organization, you might have them in a database somewhere on some server. So then the following uh, code cells. So this is just example code. These hosts don't exist. Uh, but you can then use this uh, syntax as the basis for plugging, plugging in your own, own database or your uh, organization's database. Uh, 
yeah, so for example, I use PostGIS quite actively, would love to also organize a course about it. So there's always the port information and then your credentials and so on, some SQL query. And then there's a one liner then using these uh, connection parameters to fetch data from the database based on the SQL query. But this is outside the scope of this course. Same uh, example for uh, this was now still post GIS um, spatial light database. I'll skip those, but I'll go to the very last example. So I think later, maybe next week or the following one, we will read data from web feature services. And again, those who have taken GIS courses should know what are web feature services. In short, they are kind of APIs through which, for example, uh, the National Land Survey of Finland or Statistics Finland can provide access to their data. And feature service refers to the fact that it's vector data. So this code cell you can actually run. So this fetches some uh, administrative areas from Statistics Finland. There's a URL, then there's some uh, parameters. Most important is this um, reference to the layer. Mm. And then using, again, this is a bit outside the scope of uh, this lesson, but just to explain that then this creates the request to the um, WFS. And then using GeoPandas, we can then parse those uh, features into a geodata frame. Uh, and even define the co coordinate reference system, which we will learn later today. But if you run that, uh, shouldn't take too long. Then you can see that you have actually a geodata frame, mm, some geometries and attributes. And if you run this, uh, the rest of the thing, you can actually write, write the input layer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now I got some error on this cloud computer, but maybe if we comment out KML, then it might work. Uh, so then you can uh, take a copy from the web, web feature service and have your local copy. Of course, you can do the same thing, let's say in QGIS manually, but this is one way of automating that. Okay, so if you were following everything I just said, that's great. If some of it was like, didn't mean anything to you, that's also fine. Um, so let's start then going through some of these examples a bit slower and get to know GeoPandas and related data formats more in detail. So this data IO uh, document that we quickly browse through is there for reference uh, for you if you just quickly want to find what was the syntax for reading and writing data from various file formats. All right. And again, I encourage you if there's something I said too quickly or you want to ask, I'm trying to monitor the chat every now and then. So now we will proceed in here, introduction to GeoPandas that is also available in the web pages. Uh, over here, uh, something about now the lesson to folder structure. So there is, yeah, so we had this data folder, but that was sample data for the uh, previous tutorial. So in this lesson, we will again have to have to download some data online because the files are getting bigger and bigger. So I will leave this file browser open uh, just for now. Mm, okay, so let's go uh, in this now, this part of the lesson, we will go through kind of the very basic workflow of reading in data, uh, interacting with the data, uh, doing a bit of data manipulation, uh, and then writing data to file. So those, those are the kind of processes that we will cover. And in practice, indeed, 
we will learn um, learn how to use GeoPandas, which, as mentioned, uh, combines the power of many uh, GIS open source GIS packages such as Safely and Fiona. And these GeoPandas documentation contains most of the most of the useful useful hints and if not, then you can go to the documentation of Shapely or Fiona uh, or Matplotly to find more information on, on different, uh, different methods and attributes. Mm. Okay, uh, so we have Geo Pandas. So then we have also Geo Series and Geo Data Frames as the main data types. So these are technically they are extensions to the pandas data types. So I think every mostly everything you can do with a geo data frame data frame. So a spatial two dimensional data, you can do those things with a geo data frame. Uh, the main thing in a geo data frame is that you have a column with geometries. Mm -hmm. So you have some attribute columns, it can be character string or floating point or integer. But in a geo data frame, you have one column of them called geometry that contains the geometries as shapely objects. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, for example, polygon definitions in this uh, example image in here. Now we learned to handle shapely objects last week. And so today we will learn how to handle those in geo data frames. And then one column of geometries. So one series of geometry objects is then a geo series um, in GeoPandas. And for those, you can then find uh, detailed documentation in, in the GeoPandas website, geo series and then uh, geo data frame is under here. Mm, excellent. So let's get some data to work with. I will spend a couple of moments explaining uh, the data source. The good thing here is that we are now working with real world data, but the bad thing is that it's a bit of a complicated data set in terms of data structure. I'm sure some of the students from Helsinki University have used the Finnish topographic database before, and I'm sure that those of you who haven't hopefully understand the logic of the data structure. So uh, data from National Land Survey of Finland. Um, so they have, I, we've downloaded it from this CSC open data portal. So it's distributed under open license as long as we refer to the producer. And there's different links to documents that contain metadata about the data. So there's this Excel sheet. I won't maybe open that, but maybe I will open this link. So this web page is quite nice. Uh, it's, it um, contains some description of the file names or codes in the file names that we can see. So the uh, topographic database, you can see from here, it for example has information about traffic networks, pipelines, different types of landscapes, buildings, elevation, protected objects, uh, administrative divisions and so on. And this data set, kind of the bunch of data has different types of objects. So we have areas, lines, points, text and so on. Mm. And the main point in this kind of the analytical problem in our lesson is to download a bunch of data from this topographical database and then split the data into multiple different files according to our interest, okay? So we get this kind of big bulk of data and based on the attributes, we want to generate separate files for further processing. Uh, so we have downloaded some data from the Helsinki region. Uh, you can download your own data from there if you want, but we have prepared uh, kind of a zip file for this lesson. And in practice, we will be focusing on terrain objects, I think they have now been translated as landscape objects, should fix that. Uh, but the main goal in this lesson is to 
access these landscape objects in the topographic database. So landscape objects include all of these listed in here. There's lakes, uh, parks, gardens, you name it. So mostly polygon data. And then for each of these subclass in the landscape uh, group, we want to generate a separate shape file. Mm, and that would be, for, for example, for the purposes that we only want to continue with the lake polygons and we would discard everything else or for some other purpose, visualization purposes or analysis purposes, we might, might want to have all of these data separate. Okay. Mm, uh, yes, so let's download the data and then still have a, another look at the files that we will be uh, uh, analyzing. So I again clear the check marks or maybe I did it already. So if you're working on your own computer, you can just click on the mm, download link and download the zip file. Others, let's open a terminal window. Terminal, there we go. I'll put it down here. So I hopefully can follow the instructions at the same time. So step one, let's navigate to the correct folder. LS lists the contents of the current folder. So I know where to go. I want to go into CD auto GIS. And in there, I want to go CD notebooks and then uh, CD lesson two. So I want my cursor to be in the lesson two folder. We can also do that all in one command by pasting that one. Then uh, we use this wget command to download the zip file. I press control C, then I press shift, right click, paste. Uh, goes quite quickly. Then actually, I want to then, uh, so you can just, I would suggest copy pasting rather than typing in. Uh, once you have the zip file in your folder structure, you can type in unzip l2 data.zip. I actually can't see what I'm typing because Zoom is blocking my view here. It's the day of the technical problem. So unzip lesson lesson to zip. Uh, and then finally, was there anything else? So if you manage to do that maybe quicker than I did, please put the green check mark. So finally, you can, if you want, you can run this LS uh, L2 data, but you should be able to then uh, navigate, check the contents of the folder in the file browser. So the National Land Survey data is under NLS uh, 2018. This refers to the particular tile that we have prepared for you. And then inside there, so inside this kind of very complicated folder structure, we have very many shape files with all the sidecar files. Okay, I have 14. Somebody wasn't able to, if you can, please share on chat what is, uh, what is wrong. If you are stuck. So the main point uh, was to navigate to the correct folder first and then uh, run this wget command. Okay. So if you had some problems, maybe you can post 
describe your issue in the okay so now the red x disappeared mm. uh, i'll just close my terminal window uh, so yes so please go and check the contents of the folder and now we can maybe understand what this means so according to the naming convention all files that start with a letter letter m and end with t contains the objects we are interested in so these uh, landscape polygons mm. so there is a bunch of other data but we now want to programmatically access only the files that we are interested in and then in this one file we will then have all the landscape uh, polygons related to the landscape class, uh, landscape group, and inside there we will have these feature classes. Okay, uh, so often we have st structured this lesson like this because often or the added value of automating GIS processes is starts with kind of automating the handling of inputs and outputs. And in a case like this, for example, with the topographic database, it's distributed like this. We have a bunch of shape files, um, which then contain different classes. So you might want to have a script that automates the workflow of accessing the feature class you are interested in. Uh, okay, so I have more than half of you who have said that you are ready to proceed. So let's finally start uh, start coding. Mm, something something on our own. Actually, there was a code cell in a bit weird place in here. Uh, so at some some point at the at the start of the notebook we should import geopandas as gpd and according to the convention of uh, or following the convention of importing pandas as pd we import geopandas as gpd mm, you can also of course import it down here uh, okay so then um, as our starting point is this kind of messy data folder in here. Uh, we want to import this OS module uh, to somehow systematically define our file paths. So we, from this lesson onwards, we will hopefully use actively this OS module. You have encountered it before, I think when we were using the glob but I will re-explain the logic in here. So with OS, you can, for example, uh, cut and paste folders and file names and form these kind of file paths in a dynamic way. Mm. And our uh, data is located in, uh, in kind of in this uh, folder structure. So we want to first pass that uh, as the as a character string. I'm now improvising, but I think I can. Um, let's see. So if I have the shapefile folder open in here, and if I right click on the file and then click on copy path. So let's see what it will give us. I'll put it inside the brackets. Uh, and I will actually work from here. So I hope you can follow doing that. So right click on some of these shape files, uh, copy path, and then paste, paste it in here. We could use, maybe could use this one, but let's make it a relative file path to the folder where these shape files are located. So uh, our notebook is located in this lesson two folder. So that is our working directory. Inside that folder, we have the lesson two data. So we can start our uh, folder path from there. 
So then this should work on any computer with the same file structure. Then we have all the list of all of these subfolders. And actually, the last one is the file name. So I'll uh, take that out still for a while. And then for some reason, I don't recommend having dots in the folder names, but this distribution happens to have it. So this is now the path to the, to the folder where, where all these uh, shape files are located. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we have actually, I will make a new variable file name. Mm, which is not this one, but our file name is m underscore uh, then this l for one three two r underscore and p. So we had the uh, landscape group polygons from this pile of the topographic database. If you weren't able to type these in yet, you can open the course web pages and maybe copy paste from there. Uh, there's a good risk of getting some syntax errors, uh, but I'll proceed. So now uh, we use this OS module uh, to take the folder path and then the file name and put those together. So there's this OS path join function, so os.path.join, uh, and then you pass uh, the pieces of uh, the full file path that you want to uh, put together, and then print it out. And again, I had this little r in front of this input folder so that uh, it doesn't happen that there would be something that breaks, some escape character that would break the character string. Okay. Uh, once that's once that is done, uh, we can read the shape file. And yeah, well, if you didn't yet do so, you can import GeoPandas as GPD in here. Uh, but if you already did it, you don't have to. Mm, and then uh, GPD. So mostly the same syntax as with pandas, but now we do GPD dot read file and then FP. If you had some syntax or typos in your folder path or file name, you might get file not found error if that happens go and check your uh, file path object. If not, then you should have this data variable in memory uh, and it should be a GeoPandas GeoData frame. Mm -hmm. uh, so as mentioned, we can then start exploring the data using the same approach as with Pandas. So we can check the first rows. Uh, you can see that these uh, column names are in Finnish. So we need to do something about that. Mm. If you check data.columns.values, uh, you can get a list of the list of the columns. Maybe one column that should make sense to everybody is this geometry column. So as I mentioned, when we have a geodata frame, it always has a column with the geometries. Mm, in this case, we might not see it in the printout because there's so many columns. So often it's a good idea if you have this kind of big data set with many columns in a foreign language, uh, is to first to subset the columns. If you know the columns beforehand, you can of course subset them when reading in the data. But I often do this that I print out the column values, then I paste this list of column names. Uh, and then I delete everything that I don't want. 
So we want to leave this uh, second column name, which is Ryhmä, so the group. So I delete this texti. Uh, and then Luokka. So Ryhmä, Luokka, uh, and everything else until geometry. I can uh, delete. So now I have a list of file names which I want to continue processing. Then dat data uh, brackets and inside the brackets I put the list and redefine the data. Uh, so now I manage to only have the columns that I'm interested in. So Ryhmä, Luokka and the Geometry. Mm, then we want to create a dictionary. So how to do it efficiently? I hope you also start to use these kind of shortcuts and copy paste and other commands to make your code writing a bit faster. So I will copy this uh, list from here paste it in here, turn it into a dictionary. So put these curly brackets around mm, like that. And actually geometry, we don't want to rename, so we can delete that from there. And then in order to give new names, uh, we can rename Ryhmä as group and then Luokka as class. Uh, just store that into a new variable. So sub subsetting columns, creating new column names, and then finally data dot rename uh, columns parameter gets the value call names, uh, and then in place true does the column renaming uh, in place, so replaces the value, values of our data frame. This is uh, not new, so we covered this during GeoPython. Mm. So I hope you were able to follow me as I went along. All right, so finally we have now simplified the input data, one of these shape files, uh, we have a column with group information, uh, class information, and then the geometry information. These should all be polygon geometries. Maybe if I print the whole data so you can see that the group is constant for all the rows, because these are all the belonging to the landscape group in the topographic database, but this class value changes according to the different classes. So one of these numbers represents lakes and so on. OK, so uh, let's stop for a bit. So for you to kind of hopefully to get your brains activated if they are not already all uh, twisted. So just to refresh your understanding, check your understanding uh, about basic pandas uh, commands to familiarize yourself with the data. So spend a moment to uh, calculate the number of rows, number of classes, and number of groups using pandas skills, applying them on the data frame. So let's spend a couple of minutes. I will then show the correct answer uh, and move on. Let's move on a little bit and then, then let's have a break after, after half past.
Okay, how's it going? If you resolve the questions, maybe click on the green check mark so I have some rough idea how, how things are going. We I'll start showing the right solutions because this is uh, not the core core content, but good for you to activate your your own thinking. Uh, number of rows, it's basically the length of the data frame. Uh, so it should be 4,311 rows of data. So basically we have 4,000 polygons in the data. Mm, number of classes, so we have the column class uh, in there. So let's take that as the starting point. And then there was this uh, number of uni nunig, nunig, uh method to check the number of unique values in that column. So we have 20 classes, the same that were in the list uh, at the start of the lesson, including waters and grasslands or whatever there was parks. And then uh, in the same way, number of groups. Uh, so let's count the unique values in the column group. Uh, so there is only one group in this one shape file. Then the other groups can be found in the tens of others, other shape files that we had in the, in the folder. And actually now close that one. Okay, so yeah. So this, this was now a reminder of getting some basic information from a data frame, be it a geo data frame or a pandas data frame. Uh, then uh, now that we have a geo data frame, so it's spatial data, um, it's good to visually check how our data looks like and is it like is the north in the correct uh, corner and so so on. So we can do data dot plot just as a data exploration step. And we should get a default visualization of our polygons. Mm. We will discuss plotting maps more in detail during week five, but this is a good basic step if reading in uh, spatial data to plot, just to quickly plot it on the map to see if, if it's as you expected it to be. And maybe uh, those who know the Helsinki region, somebody might, for example, recognize this shape in here, any guesses? Does it ring a bell? Uh, Yes, exactly. So it's Lake Budom. So this tile that we are working with, it's located uh, well on the Espo, Espo side of the region. So these big, big ones here are lakes, but then indeed we have all these, all these various landscape classes now all, all in one file. Uh, yeah, let's continue a bit and explore the geometry column. So that would be all of it I can call head to get the first five rows. So I have these geometric objects in there. And if you look at the coordinates in here, those of you now who are GIS wizards might even be able to guess the coordinate reference system based on these coordinates. Uh, go ahead if you have a hunch. Mm, we'll see it a bit later. Uh, we can then, of course, access the actual shapely objects. So this data dot at is quite useful um, in many occasions, but we can just take the first row column geometry and print it. So there's some tiny triangular uh, polygon somewhere in the data. Uh, and now that we have this is then actually, if I check type what is this? So that is a shapely polygon. Mm? Sounds familiar? So now that we have a shapely polygon, 
uh, I could print some information about the area. So I have this print statement in, in here ready. If I put, put this data uh, at, maybe it's actually easier to do it this way. Sorry for jumping around. So I store this as a variable, poly1. And then when I have this poly1, I can take the area, as we learned last week, mm, print that. And if you want a nicer output, you can round it, for example, like this. So these are then uh, square meters, because the uh, unit of our uh, coordinate reference system happens to be meters. Uh, OK. Mm. So that was one row of data. It was this first polygon in here. And of course, we want to maybe get information of create an area column for all the polygons. Why not? Uh, so there's, again, different ways of doing this. There is this iter rows uh, example readily filled in. You can just run the cell, and maybe I'll walk you through it. So if I take data iter rows, here I limit it to the first uh, five rows. Uh, so at each iteration, I have the index, so the row number starting from zero, and then the row, which is a panda series or uh, that contains all the data in one row. So then I can take the geometry value. So this will be one, one uh, shapely polygon, take the area, store it into a variable, and then print the information. But luckily, uh, GeoPandas is so efficient that we don't, we don't actually, for just getting the area, we don't need this syntax. But we have it in here in, if you would need to do something more complicated that you can't just do with one line of code. Mm. So data.area. If you check GeoPandas documentation, so you see that uh, GeoData frame, as long as it has a geometry column, so you can call data.area, which then prints uh, a panda series that contains the area of all of the geometries, uh, one per row. And of course, this then the measurement unit is related to the coordinate reference system. Furthermore, we can uh, store this information to a new column. Area equals then uh, data dot area. So this returns a series, which then gets assigned to this column. You can run that uh, data. Head. Let's do that. So we had this selection of columns, and then now we have this new column area. You could print this to a file and give it to your boss if your task was to calculate the area of all these polygons. Um, OK, two more steps, then we take a break. Uh, logically, we can then also do these basic, basic things, such as data uh, area uh, max. Oops, x max. Max, now I cheat and copy paste so copy this here min median oops that was not uh, average so mean mean or you could then call this data dot describe to get this descriptive statistics for the columns so sometimes you then want to drop once you have done some calculations, you might want to drop the geometry column if you want to do some, some aggregate statistics or write the data to a CSV file or these sorts of things. So uh, maybe the most, most common problems are if you are working with pandas and geopandas is that if you think you are working with a geodata frame, but then your data is actually in a pandas data frame and vice versa. So pandas data frame can contain a column of shapely objects, but then geodata frame needs to have this specified geometry column in the definition for it to be a geodata frame. Mm. Finally, uh, 
we have now read in one file, explored it, we can write data into a file. So let's take a subset. Mm, happens to be that lake water is related to the class number uh, 36200. So let's select that. Uh, data. This is a good opportunity to refresh our memory about lock. So data lock and then condition inside. And the condition should be a pandas series. So data uh, class equals 36200. I think they are integers. At least it works. So this one inside the brackets will give true or false for each row according to if the class equals to this number or not. And then the data lock will take all the rows where this condition was true and then store it to the selection. Uh, visual check. Now indeed we still have the lake bottom in there, but then we have lost uh, many other polygons. So these are now the lake polygons. Uh, and once more, now using the OS package that we have already imported, um, we can define the folder. So let's store the output to L2 data. Uh, let's call it, uh, we could call it, maybe do it like this. So file, file name equals class. Uh, 32600.shp. You could call it water, why not? And then OS, OS path join output folder file name. So now I have this uh, output file path. Uh, and then we have the Selection mm, to file output fp. And to verify that things went all right, you can then uh, go to the L2 data folder and you should have this class uh, 32600 shape file with all the related sidecar files saved on disk. Excellent. So uh, now let's take a break. If you are super eager, you can read this file in and check that it looks OK. Of course, you could then download it and open it in QGIS, whatever. So always good to check the uh, spatial layers also visually. Mm, after the break, now we did this saving the shape file for one of these, was it 20 classes we have. So after the break, we will create a script that does uh, saves 20 shape files. So one per each class all at once. Uh, yeah, but yeah, so let's, let's take a little bit of, uh, well, I don't know, fresh air, but stretch our legs anyway, and continue at quarter to five. No need. Classic Zoom muting. So let's continue on the second um, second lesson of the automating GIS processes course. We are getting to know GeoPandas, and we just learned how to write data to file. And there was this check your understanding. Some of you might have done it. Uh, I'll just show the solution. So. We can again GPD read file using the file path where we wrote the data and then check what we have should be the same same file uh, and then plot. So depending on what you did um, make sure that you didn't well yeah actually it doesn't matter if you over did overwrite the data data variable but I hear I'm reading it to another 
another variable just to test. Mm. Excellent. So if you have any questions at this point, I'm happy to answer. Uh, we will now then continue with actually doing what we just did, but making it a bit of a bigger process uh, where we'd actually then uh, efficiently somehow read in the data and split it to various uh, shapefile uh, files. Mm, just check if I have forgotten something. Yeah, so here we will do some grouping. So aggregating the data, which we covered in lesson six of the GeoPython course, and probably those who are working with the final exercise of the GeoPython course, maybe you need grouping in there as well. But very useful, and this will grouping data will be a central part of this week's exercise as well. Uh, so let's continue by checking what our data looks like. Uh, we now have this group column, uh, only one group, then we have the classes, was it 20 classes or something like that, geometry uh, and area that we added ourselves. Mm. So uh, our task is then to divide this data frame into different files uh, so that one class goes to uh, one file. For example, all lakes go into one file as we now did uh, for only one of the classes. Mm. Uh, so let's have a bit closer look on the class column. We previously calculated the unique number of unique values. We could then just verify the unique values. So these, these are the class numbers included in this, uh, uh, in this group and in this input file. Uh, and we want to group the data based on information about the class. So there will be multiple rows of data per each class value. Uh, let's create a grouped object, mm, data dot group by, uh, by class. Same thing as we have done before with a spatial data. Uh, and we can print out print out this grouped object. So it indeed does so that it takes all the rows linked to one value and makes a group out of that. And then in this grouped object, there are as many groups as there are unique values in the column that we group by. Uh, from this grouped object, we can then get the keys uh, using uh, accessing the groups and then the keys in there. So this diction, well, not the dictionary, but uh, the keys in the dictionary should be the same as the, as the value, unique values in the column. Okay, so let's then uh, access these different groups one by one. And for that, we can create a for loop around the grouped object. So at each iteration, it stores the key. So one of these class values, and then the group, which is a geodata frame that contains the rows that have this key in the column class. And then we can work on these two objects inside the for loop. Mm. To start with, we could just print the information. Uh, so the terrain class is the key. We now have these abstract numbers. And then we have, uh, we can check, for example, then how many polygons uh, each 
class has by taking the length of the group. And if you want a nice, nicely formatted output, you can add an escape character at the end. Make sure your indentations are correct. You can print the key print length of the group. So then we will get a nice print out one per each class. Uh, so we can see that some of these classes only have one polygon. It might be something special, maybe a golf course or whatever there was. Mm. And then, for example, this uh, class related to the lakes, we can see that we have 56 rows, so probably 56 polygons uh, related to or representing lake objects. Mm. Now that we have run this uh, for loop, we have in memory the last key value and the last group, so the last geodata frame that we were processing. Uh, and we can check, check its contents. So something like this is useful when you're developing your code. You can check the values of the variables and think how, how could you then process each of these groups inside the for loop. And indeed, it should be a geodata frame. So to this group object inside the for loop, we can apply everything uh, we could do we can with uh, geodata frames. OK, so now we know how to access each group individually. So then we can imagine that we can, inside this for loop, for each group, create a file name and save it on disk. Mm. There's this little info box. This is maybe a bit outdated information, but still maybe useful. So we have learned different ways of concatenating strings or formatting strings. Here are three options you might see. Uh, so if, for example, creating these uh, file names, you remember already in GeoPython, was it exercise two or three? We were creating this base name number dot uh, extension file names using a for loop, maybe in week three. So you can concatenate. So use the plus sign to have a variable with some text plus underscore plus some other uh, string character plus extension. You can use these um, positional formatting using the percentage operator. So this percentage string would be then replaced with the corresponding variable after the percentage sign. In this lesson, I think I'm using this uh, format function. So I have these curly brackets. Actually, they could have numbers in there then to put the uh, part of the file name that changes for each, uh, each iteration into its place. So this is already a good example of how to make your process more efficient, that you don't have to manually manually save the files and create the file name. So you will get a systematic uh, naming convention for your output files. So once more, uh, we will uh, define output folder. And in this case, again, let's store the outputs under lesson two data. Uh, and then, Actually, and inside there, because we will get, was it now then 20 files. So we might want to put the result, result files into their own folder uh, just to keep things organized. So you can do OS path uh, join uh, output folder. And inside the output folder, we can get uh, create a folder called results. So this becomes clear, clear when we run the next code cell that is really readily written. It's a code snippet you can feel free to recycle, for example, then in your final work. So I am now located in the lesson two folder where I have two folders and then some data. Now, if I run this, I have the result folder uh, definition 
as a character string, so less than two results. But that doesn't exist. So when you run this code cell, uh, so it checks that if this is uh, not true, so OS path exists, it takes this um, directory and checks if it is if it exists. If this becomes false, then the code executes whatever is inside the if block. So then OS make dirs, dirs, make directories. Uh, so then it creates a folder in this location. If uh, this is true, then this block is skipped and uh, Python will tell you that result folder exists already. So I didn't have it yet, creating a folder for the results. Uh, if you refresh your fi file browser, you should see this results folder in there. Um, so this can be a useful thing to have if you're processing, creating many input files inside your script. And if, it, uh, if you expect a specific folder structure, uh, so then you can check if the folder exists, if not, uh, you can create it. So using these OS, uh, OS modules functions. Most important that you know how to use this OS path join, but this exemplifies that there are other, other useful uh, methods in that package. Fine, we have the groups, we have a location for the outputs. So then we can just go ahead and uh, create the outputs. So for each uh, key, each group in this uh, group data, we want to create a file name. So as we have these different class numbers, it's a good idea to include the class number in the file name, like we did for uh, these lake uh, polygons. Mm. So I could make output name variable for that. Mm. Terrain something dot shp uh, dot format and then mm, key. So this will do so that it takes the key, which is the class number, and puts it in here. You could have zero in there, or you can have it without. Uh, if you don't have uh, kind of an index value for the format parameters, then they go in the order in which they are given. OK, so this would be our output uh, file name for each file, and for each file, this uh, this part will contain a different number according to the class key. Then with some a process like this, it's good to print out some information on the screen. So saving file, uh, we can just print out the uh, print out the name. I think that's that's enough. Mm. And then now, of course, if we would save something to this file, we would get it to the working directory. So under lesson two folder, but we want to have it in the results folder. So let's create an, the full output path or relative output path. Out, well, out path equals to OS path join. I want it to go under result folder, which was this R L L2 data. Um, and then output name. Uh, okay, so this should be then fine result folder we created, uh, defined it in here, and then created if it didn't exist. So it, it then links to this, points to this results folder underneath there. Uh, and then export the data. So we have this inside the for loop, these mini geodata frames, one at a time, group dot to file uh, out path. Uh, I'll open this results folder, which is now empty. 
Uh, so once you have defined the correct names, put in place the key so that we get a unique name for each file. Otherwise, you would just overwrite the same file over and over again. You should start getting some printout information on the screen mm, for the 20 classes. And then you get all these shape files with their adjacent uh, mini files saved in the results folder. So especially with shape files, it's a good idea to have a dedicated folder to them so that you don't lose any, any of these side files. Okay, uh, if you didn't follow, I would like you to let me know now. Uh, I think this, the process should be quite straightforward because we already know how to group data frames. We know how to iterate them. And here, the only new thing is that we are saving a spatial data layer. So we use this to file and by default, it will write a shape file uh, for which we have given the name in here. Okay, so then you could imagine you could extend we have read in the file, you could add whatever processing steps uh, for each class or do it first for the whole data set and then split the data, uh, send it out to different, different output files. Mm, okay, so that was, that's the end of our little analysis workflow and data manipulation workflow in this um, Jupyter notebook related to GeoPandas basics. There are a couple of more code cells. Oops, now I reran that. Let's wait for it to complete. Sometimes if you have spatial data, you might just want to export information in a table. So in a way, export the attribute table. So we can also save data to CSV in the same way as we uh, were able to save pandas data frames. So here I am doing so that I have this grouped object for each group, I take the area, then I sum up the areas and then round them up, uh, which will give me a panda series uh, with the class information and then the area information. So sum of areas for each class. So for example, where this is the lakes. So the lakes, as we could already see visually, lakes are the most extensive class in terms of area coverage in our uh, data set. And that Panda series, you can then save to file uh, as, as a CSV file. Uh, now we're actually not, I don't know if we, if we got a proper header for the column, probably yes. So you can run that and check the output. So that might be a useful, you can write some log files or something like this out of geodata frames. Excellent. So in sum, we have now learned how to read data from a shape file and various other data formats that we saw at the start of the lesson. Uh, we learned how to access the geometry information. So the key take home message of this lesson is that geodata frame should have a geometry column specified dedicated geometry column, often called geometry. And objects in the geometry column are uh, shapely objects. That's the key, key thing. Uh, then we learn how to write data to file. And then we learn how to automate the task of splitting a data into multiple files and saving them to shape files. So quite many things. Uh, but building on uh, the pandas tricks that we have learned already before. <laughs>